My name's Wolf, and through this series of videos, I'm going to introduce you to the crazy, over-the-top world that nerds like me love so much that is Warhammer 40,000. So, get comfy, buckle in, and prepare for a noob-splaining session. Okay, so in this video I'm going to cover the basic history of the Warhammer 40k universe from the perspective of mankind, and also some common terms and phrases you need to be aware of. So the world of Warhammer 40,000 is actually set in our universe, but just massively in the future. The only major change to the setting is that Earth is now called Terra. So here we are at the year 2000 and some pocket change, yet 38,000 years in the future the whole galaxy is an absolute mess and everyone is fighting everyone else. Which makes sense as Warmer 40k is a tabletop battle game. A tabletop game of diplomacy and tourism would be, well, somewhat boring. I mean, how would that even work? You have, what, six turns to either negotiate a trade deal with Mars, or get your squad to take selfies at a minimum of eight different tourist sites while avoiding all the cheap crap from the gift shop to win the game. Anyway, I digress. So 38,000 years from now, the whole galaxy has gone to rat shit, frankly. So let's look at some of the key events as to how that happened. Well, firstly, we need to bring the Emperor of Mankind into play. I can't give you his name as nobody actually knows him. The reason for this is names have power in the world of 40k, and people with psychic powers can use the power of your name against you to do things like freeze you or control you. I am willing to bet though his real name is something boring like Richard, and he just doesn't want to be called a dick behind his back. Now this is where we start getting into what's called the canon. Now there's two types of canon, you have the official canon which is all the stuff Games Workshop puts out, and you have head canon which is what people have made up to fill in all the holes. And when it comes to Games Workshop's canon, there's a lot of holes. Officially, the Emperor is known as something called a Perpetual. Perpetual is a kind of immortal. Now, they can die, but they don't stay dead for long. They'll either regenerate through some Deadpool-style healing factor, or just self-reincarnate. The Emperor is the most powerful human psychic ever, and quite possibly the most powerful psyker in the entire setting. Officially, the Emperor was born a few thousand years ago when 50 psychically gifted shamans all committed suicide, which means their souls transferred into something called the Warp. I'll go into more detail about the Warp later on, but effectively it is an alternate dimension made up of pure energy that is created from the emotions of all sentient beings. Should any sentient being die in the Warmer 40k setting, their soul goes to the Warp. Now back when all those shamans committed suicide at exactly the same time, the Warp was a relatively peaceful alternate dimension which means their souls could quite comfortably all merge into one super soul, kind of like the Power Ranger bots making a super soul. They then transferred themselves into a being that was just being born back on Earth, with this being later becoming the Emperor of Mankind. And so we have it that the Emperor is currently walking amongst us right here, right now, on Earth. He is, however, hiding in the shadows and just pulling the strings here and there throughout history, just to make sure mankind doesn't implode completely. Which is probably a good thing, because let's face it, humans should not be left unsupervised for long periods of time. Right, so from today onwards, for the next 13,000 to 20,000 years, not much happened. Well, that was quick and easy, just like me. Well, I say 13 to 20,000, as there is no definitive start date for the first major, shall we say, expansion of mankind, that we would call the Golden Age of Technology. The historians of 40k now refer to it as the Dark Age of Technology. I'm now going to cover the key inventions slash discoveries and evolutionary jumps that led us from where we are now to the grim dark future where there is only war. Now these are not in any chronological order per se, as anything we have that looks like a chronological order is just a best guess. But all these key events that I'm going to name now all happened during the Dark Age of Technology. Now the Dark Age of Technology started somewhere between 15,000 and 21,000 years in the future. But the one thing that all the historians can agree on, it ended round about the year 25,000. So the first major discovery of humanity was that of the war, which like I said is a kind of alternate universe which is created out of pure energy from the emotions of all sentient creatures. Should any creature die, their soul goes to the war. But there's a lot more about the war that humanity at this point doesn't know that the Emperor does. However, he's keeping that secret for, well, reasons. So when the Emperor's soul was formed in the wall, like I said, at that point it was a nice peaceful place. However, it turns out that negative emotions just happen to be a lot more powerful than positive emotions. And when you get enough negative emotions together, it turns out they can manifest as horrifically powerful, terrifying creatures. 
Most of them are gods with varying different levels of power. So needless to say, that nice peaceful place that was the warp is now a terrifying hellscape full of negative emotions and murderous gods. The good news is, those gods have to stay in the warp. A large bulk of the warp at this stage is actually controlled by three of the most powerful warring chaos gods. Those gods being Khorne, who is the god of blood and war and skulls. If you've ever heard the phrase, blood for the blood god, skulls for the skull throne, that's one of his followers. Then you have Nurgle, who's the god of pestilence and decay. And finally, you have Zeech, the god of change, knowledge, sorcery, and words that are easy to pronounce. Now, whenever any sentient creature does anything that fits into one of those three categories, that Chaos God will then get a small power boost. Once they have got enough power, they can actually break a small shard of themselves off to create a demon. Now, demons like to live in the war and eat the souls of anything that dies, which again gives that God more power. Here's the bad news. Demons can come into real space, but it is very difficult for them to do that. So at this point in the setting, the warp is now an absolute hellscape full of terrifying demons that want to eat your souls. Humanity though, aren't aware of that, but some genius somewhere came up with the idea of a warp drive. The idea being that travelling about a mile in the warp translates to about 100 miles in real space. The problem is though, like I said, the warp is just made of pure energy and emotions, so it's best described as roiling currents of colour and light. Once you get into the warp, you have no sense of up, down, left, right, which makes it very difficult to travel long distances. And also, if you spend too long just staring into the warp, you will go absolutely batshit insane. So the first warp jumps were only very short times in the warp. But as soon as all those humans got in there, all those demons that live in the warp were like, ooh, souls to eat. And they're all wrapped up in a giant metal tube. It's a giant tub of space Pringles. So they started heading over to start chowing down on all these souls, and then the humans translated back into real space just in the nick of time. And thus began a game of cat and mouse that the humans were completely unaware of that they were the mice. So eventually the demons did manage to catch a ship. And when that ship translated back into real space, all the crew were dead and horrifically mutilated, and the ship itself was twisted beyond all recognition. Now at this point, the humans still didn't know what had done it, they just knew it was bad. But this quickly led to the development of something called the Gellerfield, possibly named after the star of Buffy the Vampire Slayer. But basically, the Gellerfield stopped the demons from the warp getting inside the ships. Now you have to bear in mind, humanity at this point still doesn't know they're demons. All it knows is there's something bad in there, eating the people in the ships. But with these new Geller fields, it's made warp travel somewhat relatively safe again. However, the distances are still limited. Cue humanity's next evolutional step. Now this comes in the form of what is known as the Navigator Gene. Every so often, and very very rarely, a human will be born with a third eye. Now this third eye actually allows them to see the currents and flows of the warp without going absolutely batshit crazy. This allowed the navigators to, well, navigate all those currents and flows of light that is the warp, allowing for much longer and more accurate warp travel. Also, because the warp is just entirely pure energy, time isn't a thing in the warp either. So you can have two ships enter the warp at the same point and leave the warp at the same point, yet emerge back into real space, sometimes hours, even months apart. Ships can spend literally a few minutes in the warp and yet be missing from real space for years and vice versa. On very rare occasions, it has been known for a ship to arrive at its destination before it departed, but time travel is not really a thing in 40k, so ships getting lost in the warp for years is, well, fairly uncommon, but travelling back in time is very, very rare, except when the plot needs it to happen. So warp travel overall is kind of safe, but warp travel is the only thing humanity has got that is equivalent to any kind of FTL. So now that humanity can travel the stars, it's time to start colonising planets like a galactic game of Civ. To assist with that, the next major invention was the STC. And no, it's not something you need to treat with antibiotics or a cream. Which reminds me, it's now time for my next round of benzathin penicillin G. Please excuse me for a moment. Right, with that tablet washed down, let's talk about the STC, or Standard Template Construct. STCs are basically a giant version of the Star Trek replicators, and they can make anything needed but you do need to load them with the raw materials first. Within the STC's database is knowledge of everything that humans have ever built and more importantly, what it was used for. The way STCs work is you turn around to the STC and say, right, I'm going to go dig up that iron ore and I need some tools for it. If you're lucky, the STC will give you a pneumatic drill. If you're unlucky, you get a pickaxe. 
what you get is down to what materials the STC has available. So human colony ships were built around an STC and were very much a one-way trip to start off with. The colony ship would then head out to space in search of not just a planet, but a whole series of planets, potentially systems, for it to land on. A central site would then be chosen, the ship would land there, and would then be disassembled with all its component parts being fed into the STC to give it the raw materials needed. Now the object of the STC wasn't for it to make absolutely everything, it was to make things easier. So if we go back to the iron ore situation, if a colonist managed to dig up some iron ore, rather than put the iron ore directly into the STC, what would realistically happen is the STC would then spit out a refinery. This then created jobs for the other colonists to work in the refinery. Some of the metal from the refinery would be fed back into the STC, which in turn would then produce a factory. That factory then gives more colonists jobs. And you can see how this goes. All the colonists retain basic knowledge like how to farm, how to operate machinery in a factory, but none of them actually know how to build anything complex anymore. Because if they do need anything complex, well, the STC just makes it for them. So if these STCs were to be lost or destroyed, well, humanity would be in real trouble. And let's hope that never happens, shall we? And with that bit of foreshadowing, let's move along. Now, the Navigator gene is classed as a low-level psycho. So naturally, we're going to get another evolution jump into full-blown psychers. Now, full-blown psychers are just as rare as navigators, but instead of having the third eye, they have lots of other funky abilities, like the ability to read minds or shoot lightning from their fingertips. Now, most of the human colonies were very distrustful and wary of these psychers, and actively hunted them down and killed them for being witches. Some just shunned them, and a handful kept them around but at arm's distance. It turns out the ones that hunted and killed them were the wise ones. You see, all psychic powers in 40k are powered by all those roiling emotions that make up the war. So when you shoot psychic lightning at something, you're effectively pulling that lightning directly from the warp by opening a small portal to the warp in your mind. And the more power you use, the bigger the portal is. Now, as I already mentioned, the warp is full of nasty demons. And if you keep opening a portal in your mind, sooner or later, them, one of them is going to come and investigate that. And investigate the demons did. And when they did, it wasn't pretty. Usually, it results in the psyche exploding, leaving behind it the demon in its place, which then generally goes into a killing frenzy, as it's never had to deal with things like real space and physics before. A bit like a flat earther. Around this time, the Eldari also started to get really into extreme sex and violence parties. And seeing as they are a very powerful psychic race, this caused the warp to change from currents of emotions that could be, I say sailed, but I use the word loosely, into raging storms that began to block travel on certain routes, or causing massive detours, and these storms only seemed to be coming more often and lasting longer as time went on. So with space travel becoming restricted, and access to the few STCs scattered throughout the galaxy getting harder and harder, humanity, which at this point has been left unsupervised for far too long, decided that the best thing to do would be to make some AI robots to help out with things like building, farming, mining, taking out the trash, walking that yappy fucking chihuahua your wife insisted you buy it, and all the other shit jobs humans hate doing. Just let's face it, it always works out well when you give the shit jobs to the AI. There were three versions of AI robots called the Men of Stone, the Men of Iron, and the Men of Gold. Now in the current timeline of 40k, AI is completely outlawed and is actually referred to as abominable intelligence. Now let's have a mini quiz to see if you can guess why. A. The robots kept winning, who wants to be a millionaire? So they left with all the money leaving humanity broke. B. They got the unions involved and humans had to start walking that fucking chihuahua again. C. Nobody had seen Terminator or Battlestar Galactica, so nobody saw the war coming. And if you really need the answer to that, wait till the end of the video. We're now roughly in the year 25,000, which is roughly where the dark age of technology ends and what is called the Age of Strife begins. And it wasn't called the Age of Strife because everything was peachy. The Age of Strife lasted around 5,000-ish years. During that time, with the combination of all the warp storms getting stronger and many, many planets getting cut off from interstellar travel, and the planets that kept psychers alive were suddenly overrun by hundreds of murderous demons, so with humanity being distracted as a whole trying to figure out how they fixed the interstellar problem and how they actually killed these demons, they didn't notice the AI sneaking up behind them. This is the point where the AI shanked humanity in the back and then proceeded to kick seven shades of shoe polish out of every human colony there was. Eventually though, the AI got bored, jacked every spaceship they could find and fucked off to the Outer Rim, where they haven't been heard from since, which is probably a good thing, and they've presumably started the First Order, led by Johnny Five, who is alive, and let's see who's old enough to get that reference. 
the entire human civilization collapsed, without exception. Earth, or Terra as it's now called, did not escape from this 5,000 years of madness, and massive wars were fought across the planet constantly. The humans of Earth split into several tribes of techno-barbarians, and launched everything they had at each other. When they ran out of bombs and missiles, they used guns and bullets, and if they ran out of them, they used sticks and stones. All of the oceans were pretty much boiled away, and pretty much every resource was used up. What little resources were left were constantly being fought over. Now somewhere around the year 30,000-ish, the Eldari's over-the-top sex parties hit a crescendo and caused the birth of the fourth Chaos God, the Chaos God Slanesh, who is the God of Pleasure, Gratification and Excess, which is a mild way of explaining what the Eldari were up to during their parties. Whereas Khorne is the God of War, Nurgle is the God of Disease, Zinch is the God of Change, Slanesh is just a massive pervert. Now the explosive birth of Slanesh in the Warp caused all the Warp Storms to be blasted away, suddenly allowing Warp travel again. Not that there were any ships left, because the ones the AI hadn't nicked had at this point been broken down and scavenged for materials. Now the birth of Slanesh also created a huge rip in real space, at the point where the Eldar homeworld was. That rip became known as the Eye of Terror, and is the only natural portal into the Warp. This birth of Slanesh due to the Eldari is pretty much the point where shit went south for every species. So yeah, you can blame the slender pointy-eared bastards for everything wrong at this point onwards. Or you can thank them that we have such a cool universe to learn about. It's round right about at this point the Emperor finally noticed that humanity has been unsupervised for far too long. So he emerged from the shadows declaring himself the Emperor and Master of the whole of mankind and decided it's time for humanity to rise back up and take control of the galaxy. Again. To do that he knew he needed an army, but ordinary humans were just not good enough. This is where he started getting into genetic engineering. Now, the Emperor's intellect scale is that far off the chart, he makes people like Einstein and Stephen Hawking look dumb. Anyway, he had a look in his bag of resources to see what materials he'd got. Once he'd picked out the best materials, he then started work on his first genetically enhanced humans, which were the Custodes. Now, although the Custodes act as the Emperor's bodyguard and are veritable one-man armies, every single one of them is also a genius-level intellect and a master scholar of, well, everything. They were never intended to be his bodyguard, they were intended to be his friends, and somebody he could hold an intellectual conversation with. But because he'd used his best resources, it also turned out they were really, really expensive. As a result, he didn't want the custodies wasted on pointless wars, he wanted to save them for the really important ones. What he did need was a load of throwaway but powerful troops. So the Emperor went back to his bag of resources, pulled out all the common stuff and a few rares, and decided he's going to make the Thunder Warriors. You thought I was going to say Space Marines, didn't you? So the Thunder Warriors are the precursors to the Space Marines. You could say they're the Mark I or Generation I of Marines. They are actually stronger and faster than Space Marines. However, they are also very short-lived due to the low quality of resources used to make them. They are also prone to going into preserved frenzies, resulting in them having to be shot like a rabid dog. And pretty much every single one of them was batshit crazy. But what they were really, really good at was killing all the humans that said no to the Emperor. And the Emperor doesn't like it when you say no. So with a few legion of Thunder Warriors, he started his conquest of reuniting Earth. This is known as the Unification Wars. When I say Unification Wars, it kind of sums up the image of fighting going backwards and forwards. That wasn't the case. If you didn't submit to the Emperor, you were absolutely slaughtered by the Thunder Warriors. Don't get me wrong, when the Emperor began reuniting Earth, he was absolutely brutal about it. You surrendered everything you owned and your life to the Emperor, or he would take your life and everything you own. Wasn't much of a choice. But for the past 5,000 years, these techno-barbarian warlords had been living in their fortresses and constantly fighting with each other. So they genuinely believed that they could go up against the Thunder Warriors. Those that did, didn't last very long. As the Emperor was conquering more and more territories, he was gaining access to better and better resources. So he knew it was time to give the Thunder Warriors an upgrade. This is where he started the Primal Project, and a spin-off of that, the Astartes Project. Everything the Emperor has done so far has been genetic enhancements. The Primarchs were different in the fact that they were genetically engineered from the ground up, using a combination of his DNA and powers from the war. Each of the Primarchs represents a different facet of war, and each of the Primarchs was meant to lead a legion of space moons. The plan was to have 20 legions of space moons, but the final legion, 
their Primarch was actually twins, which meant we had 21 Primarchs. And I swear, the next time I hear a YouTuber say there was 20 Primarchs, I'm going to lose my shit harder than a Karen in a Walmart demanding to see the manager before I get everyone fired from corporate! I just want to make it very clear that when I hear a professional YouTuber claim there is only 20 Primarchs, I don't get triggered at all, not even in the slightest. Anyway. The Primarchs were always meant to be generals, but because they were made from the DNA of the Emperor himself, I suppose we could class them as his sons. And because the DNA of the Primarchs was then used in the gene seed that made the Astartes, that makes the Astartes, or Space Marines, the Emperor's grandchildren. Anyway, the Unification War is chugging along nicely, the Thunder Warriors are massacring whatever they're pointed at. The Primarchs are growing nicely in their little incubator pods, but they're still little babies at this point but we also need to delve back into a little bit of history. Now, the Emperor was a powerful psycho thanks to those 50 Shaman souls that made him, but as powerful as he was, he knew he wasn't powerful enough to fully unite mankind. So at some point, he made a deal with one or more Chaos Gods to make him the most powerful psycho ever. When this happened, we're not entirely sure, but it was before the Unification Wars, and we know what planet is on, so we can assume it was also before the Age of Strife. Now, it is safe to assume that this deal was made with Tzinch, as he is the main Chaos God associated with psychic powers. However, this has never been confirmed in the same way that Area 51 doesn't exist, but that also doesn't mean I'm wrong. Now, whatever the Chaos God or gods that he made his deal with got in return for the Emperor's psychic power up is unknown. It is, however, rumoured that the Emperor went renegade on this deal, so out of spite and also out of fear of the new Primarchs, the Chaos Gods yeeted the still then baby Primarchs in their incubator pods across the galaxy. Oh my god, I just said yeeted. Now this was a massive metaphorical kick in the balls to the Emperor's plan, but the big lad just walked it off and had a look at what was left in his inventory in his laboratory and realised he had enough genetic materials left over to start work on the Legio with the Astartes, or the Spacemans. And so recruits were found from across Earth and were genetically enhanced to become the Spacemans. Once he had a complete legion of space marines, it was also about the time that Thunder Warriors were due to complete the final battle of the Unification Wars. So the Thunder Warriors, accompanied by the Custodes and the space marines, took out the final bastion of resistance against the Emperor's will. And as soon as the battle was over, the space marines and Custodes gunned all the Thunder Warriors down. Now the Emperor was very pleased with his creation of the space marines, and just like any grandfather, as soon as you get your first-born grandchild, he decides to spoil them rotten. But to do this, he needed more guns and armour, and the only place making that was Mars. So the Emperor broke out his favourite board game of Let's Make a Trade Deal with Mars, and while he was brokering that trade deal, the Space Marines were busy running around Mars getting selfies at all the tourist spots, whilst avoiding all the cheap crap in the gift shops, and thus won the game. Now that's a callback. Now, the Adeptus Mechanicus of Mars managed to stay pretty much intact throughout the Age of Strife. This is mainly down to the fact that they are mostly cyborgs and therefore didn't require many resources. And they're also massive nerds and were too busy fucking toasters to notice that nobody was visiting them anymore. While the rest of humanity went to hell in a handbag, they settled down and started learning how to solder and weld and lots of other things that people had forgot how to do, thanks to the STCs. This was all in the attempt to make the perfect toaster. The toaster thing is a running gag in the 40k community. There is still a lot they haven't relearned, or wouldn't relearn, as they remember all about the Men of Iron and what the AI did. As a result, this made them very wary on reinventing certain things, especially abominable intelligence. What they did do, however, was gather any remaining AI programs, and effectively neuter them from actual AI down into more something like a, a pet dog. These AIs were renamed Machine Spirits, and an entire religion sprang up around worshipping these Machine Spirits. Because after all, the last thing you want is your pet dog turning around and biting you if you hit it on the nose of the rolled up newspaper. Especially if that pet dog just happens to be a 100 foot tall walking titan with enough firepower to level a city in seconds. Best to give it treats and call it a good boy. With the trade deal now secured, Mars would make all the guns, armor, and spaceships for the Space Marines and the ordinary human soldiers who were going to accompany them. In return, Terra would provide Mars with protection, not that they really need it because they've got all those Titans, but what they really wanted was exclusive access to any new tech that was discovered, specifically the databases within any recovered STCs. So now with all the resources in place, the Emperor fully built all 20 legions and sent them off on what is called 
the Great Crusade. Now we're still only in the year 30,000, so we're still 10,000 years away from where we need to be. But the Great Crusade had two objectives. Have humanity to reconquer the galaxy, and also find all those missing Primarchs. Overall, the Great Crusade was pretty much a massive success, right up until about the last moment. And then naturally, it all went south, again. But we'll save all that for the next video. And there we have it. Don't forget to like, subscribe and leave a comment. Better still, if you know somebody who could do with a bit of noob splaining on Warhammer, then share this video with them. And at any point, if you've learned something or laughed, then please hit that subscribe button. I won't ever be doing a Patreon or a merch store, so that subscribe button is the best way you can show your support and thanks for me.